In this video, we will design our first parallel algorithm, a simple algorithm. The algorithm should compute the inner product of two vectors. So the first vector is x, the bold face x denotes a vector, and it has n components, numbered from 0 to n minus 1. And I write it as a row vector, but actually it's a column vector. All vectors are column vectors. And the, t the su superscript t means transposition, turning rows into columns and columns into rows. So we have also a vector y with the same length. And we want to compute the sum of xi times yi, overall i between 0 and n minus 1. And the result we call alpha. So this is called the inner product of two vectors. And the difficulty is, how do we do that in parallel? So first, we have to decide something on the distribution. Because if we have a data distribution, the work distribution follows automatically. So we need to have a good data distribution. We need to distribute x. We need to distribute y. Now, it makes sense to take the same distribution for both vectors, because then xi and yi are on the same processor, so their product can be computed by a local multiplication. So that's the first choice we make. The other choice we have to make is we, we could use a block distribution, we could use a cyclic distribution. We want to spread the work equally. And uh, in this case, both would work, but we choose the cyclic distribution just for illustration purposes. And then, if we have such a distribution, the algorithm follows from what is the sequential, the non-parallel computation, and our decision about the distribution. So here we see uh, an example. We have two vectors, x and y. And uh, the vectors, they are spread out over uh, four processors, again denoted by the colors white, yellow, red, and blue. And uh, in the vectors, you see uh, numbers. These are the components of the vectors. So the first component, component 0 of x, is 12. And if we want to compute the inner product, what we can do is first compute the inner product for our local components. So we multiply 12 by 1, which gives 12. Then minus 1 by minus 1, which is also on the white processor. That gives plus 1. And then we multiply 3 by 3. We get 9, also on the white processor. And then the white processor adds up the 12, the 1, and the 9, and gets 22. Now the other processors in the same time, uh, they, uh, they uh, also perform a local inner product computation. So the yellow processor gets the result 8, and the others also have their own results. So this is what happens in the first super step of the algorithm. Then we want every processor to have the final result, uh, so we need to communicate. And the easiest way of doing this is that every processor sends its result to the others. For example, the 22, computed by processor 0, which is the white processor, is being sent to all the other processors. And you see it is being stored in a little array of length 4, where it is the first number. All the processors, they redundantly compute the same number, 64, which is the overall inner product. So we're going to write down the algorithm in more detail. Algorithm for processor PS, and S is the processor identity. And we need the, need the result in all processors. So we start with super step 0. We compute 
an alpha s, which is the local partial sum, initialize it to zero, and then we go through all the elements, starting at s to n minus 1, step p. We do the following. We uh, add to alpha s the product of xi and yi. And so what you see here is the, that processor s starts at s, then takes a step of p, so it gets to s plus p, s plus 2p, etc., until the end of the array. And by the cyclic distribution, this is exactly the, uh, the local, local components xi and yi that are being multiplied and added to alpha s. So that's super step uh, 0. And then we can su do super step 1. I don't write the sinks in between, but there's a sink. Uh, now we have the local result. Uh, we want to put it into all the processors. For t equals 0 to p minus 1, we do the following. Uh, we put alpha s in processor t. So t is the target processor. And this way, every processor has the, the value alpha, has my value alpha s. This is my program as a processor number s. OK, and then super step two, we start with alpha initialized to 0. And then we write for t equals 0 to p minus 1 do alpha becomes alpha plus alpha t. We add up all the alpha t's. Note that I use a dummy variable t here because it's the target processor where it comes from. And I cannot use the variable s here because s is my unique identity. OK, so now we have the algorithm. We also want to know its cost. And what I will do is I will write down the cost of every separate super step. I won't write down all the L's because we have a total of 3L because we have three super steps. Super step 0, we have a cost of n divided by p, rounded down, because we have n data elements. Uh, but per processor, we have n over p data elements rounded up. And since we have an addition and a multiplication here, we multiply that by 2. And then super step 1, it costs p minus 1 g, because we have to send our data element to p minus 1 others. So it's an h relation with h equals p minus 1. And the last super step costs p, because we just add up p, uh, p results. So the total cost then equals 2 n over p, the ceiling, plus p, plus p minus 1 g, plus now I add the L's of the synchronization. So we have here the computation time. You note the extra p that we have for adding all the partial results, communication time, and synchronization time. And now my question to you is, assume that we, instead of uh, sending my data to all the processors, I only send it to processor 0, but we still demand that the result becomes available on every processor. What would then be the cost of the algorithm if we did it that way? And what adjustments do we have to, to make? OK, so uh, I hope you thought about this. Uh, the answer is, well, let's see what we have to adjust. So instead of sending it to all of this, I just send it to p0. But then only p0 has the, all the knowledge of the partial results. So we need to write if s equals 0, 
only then we perform this. And then at the end, we need a, another super step, uh, an added super step. And this will be three, where we put alpha in P star. This is my shorthand for send it to everybody. So uh, you see, we, we need an extra super step if we do it this way. And what changes in the cost? First of all, super step one still has the same cost because processor zero receives P minus one elements. And that's the maximum then. Uh, the others don't receive anything, but that doesn't help us. This is still the cost. Uh, the cost of this uh, super step two also remains the same because in the time that processor zero adds the results, the others are idling. They are doing nothing. And the e extra super step uh, gives, uh, well, it's basically the reverse of what we had before. You're sending alpha back to everybody, and that's an extra g mi g sorry p minus one g plus l. So only sending it to p zero is not such a good idea. So as we just have seen the program that we write is in a certain fashion which we call single program multiple data. We just write one program and it depends, the execution depends on the local data. Every processor performs the same program but on its own data. So they still do different computations but we don't have to write different program texts. So why can we do that? Because the program text is parameterized in the processor number s. So s is a number between 0 and p minus 1. It is also called the processor identity. The program the execution depends on s. One-sided communication is the type of communication that we use within the BSP model. We've seen in the algorithm that I just showed that we use for communication a put statement. And a put is just what it says. I put something on a table, or in this case, I put a data word into a different processor. And the other side is passive. The receiving side doesn't do anything. And that means that in our program text, we only have to write the put. We don't need to write something like receive this data. It's being done automatically. The only question is when is this uh, being done? And uh, the answer is that we know that after the next synchronization, so the synchronization that ends the super step, we can use the data. Then we are sure that what we have put has arrived. We also have the get as a primitive, and the get we use if the receiver knows what it needs, but the sender doesn't know. Then the get is being done by an active receiver who basically requests, give me this, and then you get it. So that's one-sided communication. So as a summary, we, uh, we have seen that uh, we can write a program in a style called SPMD, single program, multiple data. We obtained an efficient algorithm, which has a formula of the form A plus B, G plus C, L. And in this case, the A is the cost of the first super step and the last super step, because that's where we compute. And this cost is 2 times n divided by p, rounded up, plus p. p was the final summation. We also communicate, and that is the communication of p minus 1 data elements. So p minus 1 times g is the communication cost. And since we have three super steps, the cost of the synchronization is 3L. And we have also seen 
that puts and gets make program tags uh, easier. Often you only will have to use puts. And an additional benefit is that in implementations in an actual par parallel program, they are also very efficient. So I have a final question to you. Design a BSP algorithm for computing the maximum in a vector x of length n, distributed by the block distribution. And to make this easier, we may assume that the number of processors p is a divisor of n, meaning that n modulo p equals zero. And we need all processors to have the result at the end of the algorithm. Write the algorithm in the form that I showed you in SPMD style. And also you should analyze the cost of the algorithm, the time it takes. Yeah.